All right, thank you for staying. Time to take a look at the dailies on Daybreak. Your guess is as good as mine. All the tragic stories. It looks almost as if tragedy has befallen the country. The president's convoy attacked in Dora. You have, you know, the death of uh, the former, I would say, the former president of OPEC, uh, Mohammed Barakindo. The Kujay prisons was attacked. And, you know, all in one night. That's what it looks like this morning. So let's have a sense of how the stories are being reported on our papers this morning. Beginning with Daily Trust newspaper. We have FG moves to stop foreign shippers monopoly in Nigeria's maritime. We are working with EFCC to stem vote buying, says Ainek Atiku. I use absence compounds PDP crisis. The lead story says... Two injured as terrorists attack presidential convoy in Katsina. Assistant police commissioner killed in fight with bandits. Presidency confirms attack. Kuje prison attacked. You'll find all of that on page four. Next story. 69 clinics sh shot in Katsina after bandits convert some to personal use. Uh, you'd also see below that betting. Farmer dies after drug overdose. Abuja Park. Operators count losses as 7 p.m. closing time commences. And then at the very bottom, hours to deadline. Seeds rocketeering. Bribery, ma hatch operations. And then the writer says, slots sold to highest bidders, according to sources. Toa operators demand 1 million naira for visas. These are the stories on the front page of Daily Trust newspaper. And on to Leadership newspaper. Leadership newspaper is not any different. The lead story says, APC asks for extra time to tackle security challenges. And then it has a writer that says, as bandits go berserk, attack Buhari's convoy on advanced trip to Katsina, kill five, abduct scores in Kaduna villages, gunmen kill two policemen, abduct Chinese in Kwara, Katsina. Uh, then there's another story here that says um, CSOs blame lingering fuel scarcity on impunity, corruption. Uh, right above the masthead, BPE, NEC, restructure Kanu, Benin, Kaduna, Ibadan, Port Harcourt Discos. Banditry, Katsina shot 69 primary healthcare facilities. Hush Poppy, U.S. court fixes September 21 for judgment. And then we have another story here. This is coming from the Delta State Governor, uh, Okowa. Issues around my certificate politicized. INEC threatens to cancel any election disrupted by hoodlums. These are the major stories on the leadership newspaper for today. All right. Now, you take a look at the Nigerian Tribune there. The lead story says... Terrorists attack Buhari's advance team in Katsina. The writer says ambush, kill area commander, one other. Twelve killed as bandits, vigilantes clash in plateau. And then you have, you know, uh, just above that, below the masthead, oil, gas, industry under siege. That's according to OPEC, unfortunately. Uh, the former president of the OPEC, who we ha understand now that has died uh, in the night. Now, you also have, we will call off strike immediately if FG accepts Utah's honors 20, uh, 2009 uh, agreement. That's according to ASU. Next story, workers threaten to shut down port operation at Nigeria's largest containers terminal. Above the masthead, your absence from investigative hearing attempt to frustrate House probe speakers tells CBN and NPC as reps summon Silva, Carey, others over the consumption probe. And then controversial 4.194 trillion naira subsidy payment. Accountant General's office opens up. And then you'd find... Uh, NSI signs $50 million carbon reduction deal with Dutch firm uh, Vital. And then FG to Buhari, it's time for our looted artifacts to return home. 
Hajj. Nakon transports 29,128 pilgrims, 920 officials in 73 flights. At the very bottom, Atiku's absence amid crisis causes anxiety among PDP stakeholders. That's that for the Nigerian Tribune. And the Sun for today has a lead story that says, Vice Presidential Slot, APC, Labour Party, NNPP, others step up consultations. It has a rider that says, intensify search to beat INEC deadline. Obi Kwankoso talks collapsed June 15, says Ume. And then uh, right below the pictorial, the, there's the story there that says, bandits attack Buhari's advance convoy in Katsina, two injured. And there's another a rider that says, Kuja prison bombed. Also on the sun, we have a story that says, Sean Tribal sentiments vote competent pres president in 2023, or Hanese tells Nigerians. And uh, there's also another story here. PDB can't win polls with divided house. This is coming from the, the legal advisor. It has a rider that says, Wiki hasn't shut his doors against party. Oshun Guba, INEC takes tough stance against vote buying, vote selling. Again, federal government rules out removal of petrol subsidy, says it will cause chaos, instability. And then right at the bottom, there's a story that says, insecurity 12 killed as bandits, vigilante groups clash in plateau. Those are the major stories on the Daily Sun. And on the Punch newspaper, we have the lead story that says, COVID-19 cases jump by 67% in two weeks. You also have the riders, Lagos NMA, NAD warn against laxity, demand protective measures, coronavirus not on holiday, it is still around, say virologist and group. I also have uh, above the mass head, their Fidelity Bank takes over three discos, FG intervenes. Terrorists attack Buhari's advance team, kill two policemen. Lagos, Kano, FCT, Ogun, lead telecom subscribers growth. State chairman reject Wiki comes anti IU plot. You also have at the very bottom there uh, subsidy probe. Reps summon Emirfele, Silva, Ahmed, Kari, and uh, Lagos couple lose four children to midnight fire. Khan disowns Ondo Pastor arrested for alleged abduction. Now, the pictorial on the Punch newspaper shows you passengers traveling to the north for the Salah celebration at uh, uh, Fadbem's bus stop along the Lagos Ibadan Expressway in Ogun State. Now, these are the stories on the front page of the Punch newspaper. And the Daily Independent leads with the PDP crisis. It says, Wiki, Bacchus soft pedal, agreed to work for Atiku's victory. And then it has a rider that says, party charges Nigerians to vote APC out. And it also has a story that says, 20, 27 years after, FG considers establishing new Nigeria shipping line. Also on the Daily Independent, oil industry under siege from multiple fronts. This is coming from the OPEC boss. Missing certificate, I made second best result in 1976. This is coming from the uh, uh, vice presidential running mate to uh, article for the PDP, Okoa. Then we have a story here that says, Dangote customers to win one billion in new cement promo. Uh, we ha we've devised ways of rendering th thugs useless during polls, uh, INEC. These are the major stories on the Daily Independent for today. All right. So um, let's get perspectives to this. We have in the studio Sadiq Jikta, National Coordinator, Fusion 774, to talk about some of these stories on the front pages of our newspapers. Thank you so much for joining us on today. Thank you. All right. and good morning. Well, let's begin with the sad one, the very unfortunate one. A lot of things happened through the night yesterday, and uh, I'm sure a lot of Nigerians will wake up to tragic stories. Mm. One, 
It's about the death of uh, the former president of OPEC, mm -hmm. Mohammed, uh, Secretary General rather, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, OPEC, uh, Mohammed Sanusi Burkindo. Mm -hmm. um, quite a sad one. Just yesterday we were hearing how the president was extending the nation's gratitude to him mm -hmm. uh, after a meritorious service you know, in OPEC and uh, how that he has made Nigeria proud and all of that. And then a few hours later, we're hearing that he has died. Quite a sad one. Really how sad. does this come to you? Yes, a uh, very sad one because uh, it's a personality that has uh, done a lot for the country. And uh, he's a big name uh, in the oil industry. And uh, he has a good track record. And losing somebody like this is really sad for the country. Not just me, but the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he has represented. Nigeria in various capacity and uh, uh, at this point uh, losing him it actually uh, I think it's have uh, kind of its effect to the uh, oil industry petroleum industry in the country yeah. yes. all right now other stories the issue of uh, the president's convoy being attacked in Dora we understand that this is an advanced team uh, ahead of his planned trip for the Eid al-Kabir celebration mm. uh, by weekend. And then this happens, you know. Uh, it looks like the terrorists are becoming more daring and more emboldening and more strategic with their attacks because this is more like, it's not just about the attack now, mm. it's about the message that they are trying to send. Maybe attempt to tell the president, stay put, don't come here. Something like that. Yes, I think that's, uh, I see it that way too. Because uh, if they can be bold enough to attack the convoy of the president, I think uh, they are trying to make a statement to tell the government that uh, they can uh, uh, attack in, at any point and to tell uh, the government that uh, they are in control. You know, and so unfortunate that they can go to such an extent and the government. Uh, for the period of time, couldn't like uh, foresee uh, such happening. Well, apart from the fact that they went after the convoy of the president yesterday, yeah. yes. in the same Katsina, the home state of the president, before that attack, there was another attack where an assistant commissioner of police lost his life hmm. in when he was trying to, you know, dispel. Uh, uh, the terrorists. Uh, uh, about 300 of them were involved in the particular attack. Mm. In the same Katsina, yes. 69 healthcare centers have been shut down because terrorists, because of attacks from terrorists. All of these are happening in the president's hometown. Yeah, this is very. Why uh, is that so? It's very unfortunate. To tell you, the government is not in control of the situation. I know the terrorists are trying to make a statement to let the government know that uh, uh, whatever the government are doing, they are also in control. Uh, I think uh, at, uh, in such a uh, period of time where we are approaching the uh, Idul uh, Kabir uh, celebration and the government, uh, the, the president planning to go for his uh, break, his Allah break, uh, the terrorists coming up with such an attack, I think uh, it's to make a statement and to uh, let the government know that, yes, they can attack at any point and government need to step up and know that uh, the terrorists are really bold into you know, uh, uh, attack at, at any point. I uh, see it as a statement to the government to step up their effort. It Everybody that has come here says government should step up. And after they say the government should step up, the next day there will be an attack. In fact, that particular day there will be an attack. Yes. Why hasn't the government stepped up? Really so unfortunate because uh, it is the pro it's really increasing every day by the day. We, we don't, can't understand why this is happening. And it's so unfortunate that uh, government, I think they need to review their strategy and really do something about that. We c don't really understand what's happening. I think if uh, uh, government that really knows what it's doing, if uh, something like this is happening, you try to go to the root cause of this situation. You see, uh, but the way things are going, we don't see anything differently. We have not seen anything differently. That's so, why this is happening. So, so going by, you know, all these things, does it now validate the, uh, the, 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 the points or the ideas that uh, others have echoed, like the governor of Zafar State to say, look, everyone should defend himself. 
people should, you know, get arms and get licensed and defend themselves. Do you, you know, agree to that? It has got to the point that I think I have to agree with that. Because if people are dying in the rate we are seeing, and government cannot come up to solve the situation, I think people should help themselves. But people, people, have, but, people, but people have said that to little anarchy. I don't think so. I don't think so. There are ways that I have been, I've always been an advocate of uh, uh, not just uh, government. Government can provide security for the country. We are over 200 million. And our, if you look at the number of our security agency, I think we are uh, under, we have a low number compared to international standard. We can meet up with the international uh, standard for uh, security by, I can't really get out the figure, but I know we are below the standard. So uh, if we can have an extra uh, ex effort by the community, it's okay. Community engagement is one area that government can explore. For example, I, for example, we have a case study of uh, Borono State where when uh, we are, were at the peak of the Boko Haram uh, insurgents, we had this uh, civilian, uh, what they call the civilian JTF. They were the ones that really com came up to really uh, uh, help solve the situation because they know the terrain more better than the security men because security men are brought in from outside. So the locals know how the terrain is, and I think they will provide more better security than, uh, than the government, or they can help. Mm -hmm. Because if they are involved in solving this very particular uh, problem, they will, uh, will get a very better result, and things will happen. Uh, you know, some have said, it, some have queried the, effective, the, the, the effectiveness of some of these arrangements that we, have make, we are making. Yes. Uh, for instance, you have vigilantes at the moment who are not even armed. Uh, so if, 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 if the vigilantes are not armed, how do they even, I mean, at best, what they can do is to help, you know, collaborate with security forces, yes, uh, show them the terrain and provide certain critical information that will be needed. But beyond that, in terms of protecting communities and, ensure, and ensuring, uh, repelling attacks, you know, uh, and ensuring that people are not killed, yes. you know, how much can be done? Uh, you know, how much more do we need to, be, to do? Because, again, another example is the Amotekun Corps in the southwestern region. Yes. A lot of, you know, complaints about, you know, them not being armed has limited how far or how much they can, you know, help with the whole issue. Of security. You, so see, you see, that's the issue. The government are, try, are monopolizing the security situation. They, ha they want to be in total control. That can happen. You have to engage the community and if uh, need be, uh, arm them, arm this group, because they will complement the, the, the government. If you arm them, you control and you vet them, you give them the necessary training. They can always intervene because the government security agency cannot be at a particular point in time. So the locals would always be there to intervene whenever there are, there are attacks like this. So me, I see it as government intervening to like a particular group of the uh, vigilante they are talking about, uh, arm them, give them arm and uh, like form another arm of security, no, no, not really a full-fledged government arm, but uh, people intervention uh, uh, mechanism that will help because the extent we are going now, it's, it's getting emboldened every day. If you see uh, during the uh, uh, Boko Haram period, it wasn't as rampant as it is today. But, you know, as time goes on, as time progresses, we see different uh, intervention, different security uh, attacks, different uh, the headsmen attack, the uh, bandits attack, the kidnapping. It's increasing by the day. So. With all the attacks that happened in the northeast, yes. he took uh, it happened for almost ten years, and it's not that it has stopped, but it has reduced. Now it it appears the attacks have now moved to the northwest, and experts are expressing concern that are we going to have another ten years or five years, eight years of struggle in that region? Because if you look at the Daily Trust report for today, it's not. Yes, this particular attack happened in Katsina, but then there's been an attack in Zamfara, there's mm. been an attack in Kebi, sure. and all that region, and even in Kaduna. Yes. As I've said earlier, it will continue to happen because uh, they are beginning to understand that uh, government is not at the top of the situation, and they feel they can uh, come 
you know, attack and get away with it. That's the feelings now. If government cannot be at the top and I feel that, yes, I can go do whatever uh, criminality I want to do and get away, it will continue. You see how it's escalating by the day, by different regions. Uh, could remember, northeast at first, now the northwest is gradually going southeast now. Even the, yesterday, was at, there was attacking uh, Plateau uh, the, also. The, the, you see? So government need to step up. It's, uh, you know, experts have always said that the challenge of countries of the, for the 21st century security challenge is no more external uh, attack from external uh, aggression. It is in countries will continue to contend with internal security. That is the challenge of countries, mm. the next generation. Mm. So we have to like internalize our security system. We have to step it up. We have to bring different strategy mechanism. Engage the citizen. That's why I feel. All right, moving away from yes. moving away from security. Another story on the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, as to deadline, seats racketeering, bribery, ma hajj operations. Does that bother you? That's another story that has you know uh, caused a lot of disappointment and frustration for a lot of people. So. Uh, well, what's your take on what's happening right now with the whole Hajj exercise this year? You see, this, this is not new. Maybe the media don't uh, uh, usually uh, publicize it because uh, I don't know the reason, but this has always been happening. If you see people going for Hajj, they always complain of uh, uh, maltreatment by the officials. So I believe the government should have to do something by looking into the situation. This year's one appears to be a bit more than just maltreatment. Yeah. Because there's been allegations of bribery, there's been allegations of sick uh, racketeering, there's been all sorts of allegations. Yes, that is why the government has to step up and look, uh, look into it. The government has to do something. If there's complaint, you have to have a mechanism of looking into the situation. Uh, but if this, uh, this is happening and uh, nothing is done, I think it will continue. This is not the first time. The, uh, it has been like that before, and I think nothing has been done. That's why we are still here. Have we always you know had why, this? You know why yes. this? You know why this year's own seem to be peculiar? Is that okay. the slot for Nigeria has been dropped for um, um, dropped uh, about fifty percent? You know, because of of course the COVID nineteen and everything. Hmm. Uh, you know, so uh, all of those changes have been made. So from slot of say ninety five thousand. You know, before now we are talking forty-three thousand. You also have backlog. This is the first Hajj uh, since COVID nineteen. Mm. Uh, backlog from twenty 2020, twenty 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 one and some even twenty uh, twenty nineteen. You know, mm. and all of that. So that compounds the whole problem. People have made payments. Some you know are said to not to have you know received their visas. You know, because probably because of delays in documentation and the rest of them. Some are said to have made payment into personal accounts of some people mm. and all of that. Do you think that maybe the EFCC should, you know, visit some of these uh, Hajj commissions? Yes. I believe the EFCC have to look into the matter. If you could remember, there's this case of this case with, uh, uh, I think, uh, a non-governmental, an operator of a non-governmental organization who you know, came out to accuse uh, is it the former uh, director of uh, Hajj operation. But at the end of the day, uh, nothing was done. Uh, government should have looked into the matter and tried to see how reforms could be brought in. And uh, this has uh, made it worse because of the uh, uh, cut down on the numbers of people that would travel. And so uh, government need to like look into it uh, properly and uh, EFCC, as you said, you need to visit it and uh, uh, look into how these things run since there are complaints. We have to look into it and there should uh, be a kind of advocacy to those that have been there before, uh, should really uh, give way for those that, that have not been there before. Priority mm -hmm. should be given to first timers. And that this could be a way of managing uh, the situation. Well, right. for this year, with everything that has happened, even when, if EFCC goes in and investigates and maybe finds some Hajj officials culpable and all of that, how about these people who, the victims, 
those who maybe because of the actions of the Hajj officials were unable to perform the, the pilgrimage. Is there, should we call for any, I mean, is there any need for compensation or anything for those ones? In my opinion, I think uh, they should be compensated one way or the other. Yes, they, should be, they shouldn't just uh, lose their money like that because it's, uh, I, think I see it as failure of governance. If government should fail in their responsibility, if people saddled with the responsibility could fail, citizens shouldn't be at the, uh, uh, the receiving end. Government should have to be, do something about it. There should be kind of an incentive or mechanism to uh, help them out. That's how I see it. Mm. All right. Now, away from that, uh, we take a look at some political stories. Uh, the PDP is in the news. Uh, the Guardian is leading... Uh, with the PDP story, the nation is leading with the PDP story. Uh, the Daily Independent is also leading with the PDP story, and basically, it's about the the, the, the internal crisis arising from the uh, party primaries that was held and the subsequent decision to pick uh, Ifan Yokoa as the running mate of mm -hmm. the flag bearer Atiku Abubakar, who is said to be, you know, in Dubai alongside mm -hmm. the national chairman of the party and all of that. So everything mm -hmm. seemed to be on hold for mm -hmm. the PDP right now. In fact, the Guardian newspaper puts it, says, PDP awaits Atiku, are you to settle crisis? You know, this is just a uh, few days before the deadline for substitution, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the for running mates, the opportunity for them to get to do any kind of substitution and all that. Mm. What's your take on this? Yes, I think uh, yeah, it has always been like that at uh, a particular point of uh, political uh, transition. You see, people agitate because uh, maybe uh, things uh, didn't go in their favor. Like uh, for the PDP, you know, since after the uh, selection, uh, yes, the primaries and the selection of the VP, it has always been from one uh, trouble to another. But I believe they will come over it and settle it. And well, you agree settle. with me that the PDP has been in crisis for a long time. No. It only got worse with the primaries and then the yeah, selection sure, of the VP. I, I, Do you see them coming out of this before the general elections? I see, I see them coming out of it. I see them because... Uh, uh, Wiki has always been at the center, but uh, he is coming up to really see, uh, be because there's this, uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, uh, talk, this media uh, that's issued that is in the media that Wiki is leaving the the party, but he has come out to clarify that he's going nowhere and he he, he still remains in the party. So. Uh, with that, I believe that uh, they will get over it and settle the issue. It's always like that. Uh, aggrieved uh, members who always uh, have their... He seemed to have the support of uh, some of the committee members that were set to screen for the running mate uh, of the uh, Party. flag bearer. Right. Okay. And also some governors of the PDP and all of that. He seemed to also have the sympathy of a lot of people. Uh, given the given his contribution, you know, in the party mm -hmm. and all of that, people felt that he has been an anchor in the party, holding it together even before this time. And so, at this point in time, it should be a time for reward for him, not, uh, you know, uh, the way he is treated and all of that. So, if he decides not to hearken on to all the pleas and the negotiations and the everything, what do you see happening? Yes, I think it will affect the party negatively because, as you have said, Wike is a strong force in the party. He has always been there in difficult times and I so like his way of uh, politicking because Wike is not that kind of a politician that will jump from one party to another like the rest of the politician does. Uh, you know, uh, that's why they are very careful with him and Wike has a lot of followers in the party and uh, trust. Of party members, and uh, like during the selection of uh, the VP uh, for the party, VP candidate for the party, you know, uh, there was vote, and I think the most of the governors voted uh, for him. But uh, as we hear, Atiku, you know, people went and came up with uh, a different candidate whom 
the governors who have influence in the party did, uh, didn't uh, vote for. So uh, I think uh, this is what is bringing up this very crisis. But Wiki has a lot of those that were in support of him, and that's why things are going like that. But uh, I see them coming out of the... But, and the PD, uh, the Daily Trust, too, has uh, a story on its front page that says, Atiku, I use absence, compounds PDP crisis. Um, why do you think both of them are not around at this point, despite the, the crisis in the party? The candidate is not around, the, the chairman is not around. Yeah, I see it as a, a kind of a way of, you know, allowing the temple to uh, simmer down. Allowing the temple to simmer <laughs> down when the, when, when the party has been, been torn apart. Yes, by the time it has calmed down, they will come with new air of uh, uh, discussion, you know. Right? That, heat, that heat, you know, have already calmed down, and now we can now come to the round table. I think that's kind of a strategy, or otherwise, they are there to re-strategize on the next, uh, next move. So we cannot see we, uh, uh, what they are over there, where they, they went for. But what we will say is, I think they are there for good of the party. All right. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Sadiq Jikta, he is the National Coordinator of Fusion 774, uh, joining us as our guest reviewer this morning to talk about the stories on the front pages of our newspapers. We appreciate you coming on Daybreak. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you for now, we'll take a short breather. And then at the top of the hour, we'll take a look at the headlines again and take a, have a sense of what the mood is in the country at the moment. Please stay with us. When the situation where you fight